a moment. And I think we're on. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Those of you watching on Facebook Live, uh, Zoom today, and eventually YouTube. So, the Parsha today is uh, Vayeshev, and it, uh, we're going to be focusing on Genesis chapter 39. So, uh, once again, I'll greet everyone who's tuning in with Shabbat Shalom, peace of the Sabbath. And uh, I'm Rabbi Ben. I'd like to just begin and say uh, greetings to everybody. And I, I hope everyone had a nice Thanksgiving this week, if uh, you were doing that kind of thing two days ago. Uh, but I'm, I'm not here today to give you the, the warm and fuzzies of holiday cheer. No, today I want to help you to see through the craziness and warped values we see all around us in these days. To see clearly the pathway that is ahead of us. And yes, we live in troubled times. And yes, these are uncertain times. But there's a path through our struggles and challenges. If you will, stay with me today and let me help you to see clearly the path through these things. Our sermon today is called Stronger Ever After. Stronger Ever After. But not like it sounds, it's not a fairy tale. It's truth of scripture and historic human behavior. Have you ever heard the, heard the saying, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger? Have you ever heard that saying? You know, we see so much suffering and serious challenges in today's world. But on the other side of that, on the other side, when we had come through the fire, there is a, a, certain, a certain strength that we could not have had any other way. A certain strength that we could not have had in any other way. You know, about a decade ago, about 10 years ago, there was a popular country song. I'm not much of a country uh, song fan, but there was a popular country song by a group named Ricochet. And the song told the story of a man, told the story of a man who was sitting down somewhere when he noticed a young woman that he'd grown up with, and she was looking right at him. And in the chorus, in the chorus, uh, he told of all her qualities that made her appealing to him. And I'm not going to try to sing this, but I'll read the lyrics, some of the lyrics of the chorus to you. It says, she's got her daddy's money and her mama's good looks, more, more laughs than a stack of comic books, a wild imagination, a college education, add it all up, it's a deadly combination. She's a good bass fisher, a dynamite kisser, country is turnip green. She's got her daddy's money and her mama's good looks. And look who's looking at me. It's a cute song. But what caught my attention, what caught my attention is that the singer was describing a woman that most people today would consider successful in this world. She had all the advantages any person could want. Money, looks, education, obvious good taste. Now, there are people in this world, many, many, many people. I won't say the majority because I just don't know. But there are many people in this world that will look at this kind of person described in the song and get a little bit jealous. They really would and get jealous. They think to themselves something like, 
If only I could have their advantages, if only I had their family, if only I had their money, their education, I could be accomplishing great things with my own life. You know, several years ago, there was a famous study done by Victor and Mildred Gortzel, and it was entitled Cradles of Eminence. Cradles of Eminence where they examined the backgrounds of 300 highly successful people. People such as Winston Churchill, Teddy Roosevelt, Helen Keller, Albert Schweitzer, Clara Burton, Clara Barton, uh, Gandhi, Einstein, Freud. And among the things they studied were how these prominent individuals grew up. How did they grow up? And what they found was astonishing. They discovered that three quarters, two thirds, three quarters, well, three quarters of their children endured poverty or broken homes or were raised by parents who rejected them, were over possessive or dominating. Nearly all the writers 74 out of 85 writers of fiction or drama and 16 of the 20 poets came from homes where they experienced tense psychological drama. In other words, their parents didn't get along and screamed and abused each other. And over a quarter of these great people suffered from physical handicaps such as blindness, deafness, or crippled limbs. It makes one wonder if the kind of home life that these men and women endured as children influenced the type of people that they became. In our Parsha today, we read about a man named Joseph who overcame these really great problems in his life. You see, Joseph came from a highly dysfunctional family. Today we might call it a blended family. You know, the 12 brothers were born of four different mothers. And the brothers always seem to be fighting about something. About the only thing that united their uh, Joseph's brothers was their hatred of him. And because his brothers hated him, Joseph ended up thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, and ultimately accused of a crime he didn't commit. And he was thrown into prison. Joseph's brothers had actually planned to kill him, by the way, but their greed overcame their hatred long enough for them to say in Genesis 37, what profit is there if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come on, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. And then they soaked Joseph's cherished coat in goat's blood and brought it back to their father and they watched callously as their father cried out in anguish, tore his garments, and mourned for days and days. And with brothers like that, Joseph didn't need any enemies. So in Genesis 39, we find Joseph in Egypt now. And Egypt had already become a great nation before Joseph had even been born. They'd already built their famous pyramids, the Sphinx and the Temple at Luxor. And in those days, as now, Egypt was a huge tourist attraction. People came from all over. But Joseph wasn't there as a tourist. No, no, no. Joseph was there as a slave. He had been ripped from his home and his friends, dragged across the desert to a land that he'd never known, and surrounded by a strange people who spoke in a language he didn't understand. Even if he could have gotten away from his slave owners, his captors, he probably couldn't have found his way home. At 17 years old, he'd lost everything that he'd loved and considered important in his life. And now 
He lives at the whim of his master. He's the lowest form of life in the nation of Egypt. He has nothing, he owns nothing, and he is nothing in the eyes of Egypt. Just like all the other slaves of that day, he has no rights, no status, no value. But Joseph didn't, he did have one thing that other slaves in Egypt didn't. He had a God who cared for him. Now, ordinarily, most people who'd go through problems like Joseph's would doubt God was even exist at all or that he even cared about anything. And so in case you had any doubts that in Joseph's life, God wanted to reassure you, so he put in the story one phrase that shows up again and again and again because God knew that 3,000 years later we'd be reading this. And he wanted this extraordinarily spiritual text to feed us, to minister to us, to build us, to show us a pathway. You know what that phrase was? The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. You see it in verse 2 of 39, verse 3, verse 5, verse 21, and verse 23. Again and again and again. God was with Joseph. And because God was with Joseph, Joseph was successful in everything he did. And that success bled over to others. Genesis 39, verse 5 says, From the time that he, talking about Potiphar, made him an overseer in his house, and over everything that belonged to him, Adonai blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. Adonai's blessing was on everything that belonged to him in the house and in the field. Everything. Later, when he was thrown into prison, God does it again. Genesis 39, 21 to 23 says, But Adonai was with Joseph, showing him grace and giving him favor in the sight of the prison warden. And the prison warden made Joseph, supervisor of all the prisoners in the prison, so that whatever they did there, whatever they did there, he was in charge of it. And the prison warden paid no attention to anything Joseph did because Adonai was with him, and whatever he did, Adonai prospered him. Now Joseph, okay, putting things into perspective here, Joseph was still a slave, and later he was just a prisoner. But even in those low and despised positions, Joseph became someone that others depended upon. They depended upon it. God being with him made all the difference. God being with him made Joseph's life have value and purpose, even as a slave, even as a prisoner. Joseph's life is for us a case study in the faithfulness of God's promises because God has made us the same promises. Even you, all throughout scripture, you go to all the way to Hebrews 13, verse five, it says, I will never leave you or forsake you. You know, one of my favorite passages in the Tanakh and the, the Jewish scriptures is in 2 Chronicles 16, verse nine. 2 Chronicles 16, verse nine. It says this, the eyes of Adonai, the eyes of the Lord, range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are wholly his. To strengthen them. Are you fully committed to God? Because if you are, then God's looking for someone just like you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to, to make you stronger ever after. Psalm 34 verse 16 assures us that the eyes of Adonai are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. And Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. 
So you see, it doesn't matter what happens in your life, things that are good or things that aren't. If you're a true believer and you love God, he will make all things work together for your good. At a time when Joseph was a slave, at a time when his brothers sold him into slavery, they threw him into the pit, they got rid of him. Lydia thought he would never see his, his father again, his mother. When he was put in prison for a crime he didn't commit, how many of us would give up and say, there is no God? But he didn't. And God knew that he was that Joseph loved him. There was a faith there. There was a relationship. If you're a true believer and you love God, he will make all things work together for your good. God will be with you. Just like he was with Joseph, whether he was a slave or a prisoner, God was looking out for him. Question though, why allow Joseph to remain a slave or a prisoner? Why not simply remove him from those terrible situations, place him in a lovely home where he could sip lemonade and cast his line in the river all day long, enjoying himself? Bass, bass fishing in denial, not denial, denial. You know, there's something, there's something suspect in human nature, there's something suspect about a faith that has never been tested. I have faith, I have faith. You've never known troubled times, you've never fallen down, you've never got crushed, you've never been broken. So your faith hasn't been tested. There's something suspect about that. Let me put it in, this, in a different perspective. An army going through basic training is not ready for battle. Not until the soldiers have faced the battle and been under fire do they consider themselves proven, hardened, worthy. A ship cannot prove that it has been sturdily built as long as it stays in dry dock. Its hull must get wet. It must face a storm to demonstrate genuine seaworthiness. My point is this. Joseph was meant for great things. God had given Joseph two dreams that promised him his life would mean something. He didn't know what it was at the time, but it, it was something special and it had not yet been revealed. But when the dreams were given, Joseph was only 17 years old. He wasn't old enough to have the character or the experience necessary to accomplish the things God wanted him to do. The tools that God used to shape Joseph's character may seem harsh to us. Slavery, imprisonment, abandonment of family. But you see, God knows the objective that he wishes to obtain and he knows the best tools to get it done in our lives. There was a uh, scholar who... Uh, uh, a Bible scholar who died around, the, uh, you know, two, one, a couple of years after I was born, early 60s, and his name was Tozer. And he once talked about God's tools, and I like what he said. This is what he said. He said, the hammer is a useful tool, but the nail, if it had feeling and intelligence, could present another side of the story. <clears throat> <clears throat> he said, for the nail knows the hammer only as an opponent, a brutal, merciless enemy who lives to pound it into submission, to beat it down out of sight and clinch it into its place. That is the nail's view of the hammer. And it is accurate except for one thing. The nail forgets that both it and the hammer are servants of the same workmen. Let the nail but remember that the hammer is held by the workman and all resentment toward it will disappear. You see, the carpenter decides whose head shall be beaten next and what hammer shall be used in the beating. That is his sovereign right. 
when the nail has surrendered to the will of the workman and has gotten a little glimpse of his benign plans for its future, it will yield to the hammer without complaint. Tozer continues. He says, the file is more painful still for its business is to bite into the soft metal, scraping and eating away the edges until it has shaped the metal to its will. Yet the file has in truth no real will in the matter, but serves another master as the metal also does. It is the master and not the file that decides how much shall be eaten away. What shape the metal shall take and how long the painful filing shall continue. Let the metal accept the will of the master and it will not try to dictate when or how it shall be filed. One of the titles given to the Messiah in the uh, good news, the Gospels, is Master. Rabbi, Master, Lord. Tozer finishes with this. He says, as for the furnace, it is the worst of all. Ruthless and savage, it leaps at every combustible thing that enters it and, ne and never relaxes its fury till it has reduced it all to shapeless ashes. All that refuses to burn is melted into a mass of helpless matter without will or purpose of its own. When everything is melted, that will melt, and all that is burned that will burn then, and not until then, the furnace calms down and rests from its destructive fury. All that matters is to understand that it is the master who shapes and bends us to his will. And only when have we been shaped and molded can God use us as he sees best. But there's a harshness that takes place that God uses to shape us. A harshness. One man, one man told of watching an experienced gardener transplant some flowers. <clears throat> he watched in amazement as the man took the flowers out of their pots and shook them roughly. He thought this man was surely destroying the flowers. And when he asked the gardener why he handled the flowers that way, the man explained. He said, the flowers that came here have roots that are all cramped in those little tiny pots. What I do is loosen the soil and give the roots a chance to breathe and stretch. And essentially, that's exactly what God did with Joseph. He was shaking Joseph down to his very roots because he was going to replant him in a place where he could be used by God. You see, the task God wanted Joseph to accomplish was critical to Israel's future. God knew Israel's future could only be accomplished with its beginnings in the land of Egypt. Joseph became a pioneer of God's will, bringing this fledgling nation down to the protective power of Egypt at that time. But in order for Joseph to accomplish this great task, he was going to have to be put through the trials necessary to make him effective as God's tool. You see, God uses the harshness that we often go through to mold us, to shape us. The Messiah said in John 16, verse 33, John 16, 33, the Messiah said, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. God may not always bring those harsh circumstances into our lives. But no matter what difficulties that we encounter, God can use it for his own divine purposes. You know, back in the, uh, in the 90s, 
Researchers who examined the effects of post-traumatic stress syndrome, I'm sure you've heard of it, uh, you know, when you think of post-traumatic stress syndrome, do you think of it as being positive or negative influence in a person's life? Negative, obviously. But these researchers discovered that this wasn't always the case. I found it interesting. In fact, they found that trauma often had positive influences on people's lives. It was a significant enough in their study that they branded this new phenomena as PTG, post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth. PTG. They found that the following characteristics were often found in PTG. Among them were these. One, acceptance. Those who suffered this type of trauma tended to live in denial or avoidance. They often wallowed in self-pity. But in those who experienced PTG, post-traumatic growth, that changed. Instead of denial or avoidance, they chose to confront their past trauma and, con and current tormentor. They accepted their own limitations and misfortunes. And more importantly, they accepted that suffering was necessary for them to gain valuable knowledge and to grow in their character. Two, affirmation. Their suffering caused them to see the world as dark and their future bleak. Based on their painful experiences, they had concluded that most people were selfish and that uh, there was no justice in the world. Yet while hitting rock bottom and in the throes of struggling, they rejected that thinking and affirmed that there is goodness in life and there is meaning and purpose in suffering. Post-traumatic growth. Number three is determination. They had felt controlled by their circumstances, but when they experienced PTG, they became determined to control whether, uh, rather than to be controlled. They decided to make progress in their lives each day until they came out of their problem. And as they began to do this, they realized, thinking something like, if I can survive this, I can survive anything. I know that the forces of evil are still there and the obstacles are still there. The difficulties are formidable, but not insurmountable. Yes, I can overcome with God's help and with support from others. Number four was interesting in the study because it's about faith. It's strange how in times of terrible crisis, faith seems to emerge triumphant. See, in, it says in the study remarks that in the midst of their difficulties, they wondered if God even cared, but the fog lifted from their hearts and they came, uh, and they come to the realization that God was with them and sharing their pain throughout their struggles. God didn't shield them from suffering. Instead, he gave them the patience to endure and to learn. You see, those with post-traumatic stress would simply take the dark road. Those with post-traumatic growth would learn from their experience, would grow from their experience, and they would climb that mountain. Number five is unselfishness, an interesting thing. They said uh, initially they were preoccupied with their own needs. They felt sorry for only themselves. But as they grew out of their depression, their eyes became opened to realize that others suffered more than they had. They began to seek out opportunities to help other people. You know, sometimes you're going through a lot of stuff and, and when you take a break to go help somebody else, you kind of forget your own problems while you're helping the other person. You see, they discovered that in helping others, they found healing for themselves. And these are some of the things that God can teach us in our own difficulties now, today. And when we allow him to work in our lives, we can change into better servants than we ever were before. Bear with me. I'm leading up to my closing now. There was a uh, story told of a woman's Bible study. 
and they were the ladies were reading through the book of Malachi. Some people unfamiliar with the with the Bible sometimes tell me I was reading Malachi. Said he's not the Italian prophet. His name is Malachi. Anyway, they were studying the prophet Malachi, and they came upon a scripture. Malachi three verse three. It said he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And this verse puzzled the ladies. And they wondered how this statement could possibly apply to the character and nature of God. One of the women offered to find out more about the process of refining silver and get back to the group at their next Bible study. And she called up a silversmith and made an appointment to watch him while he worked. And she didn't mention anything about the reason for her interest. Beyond her curiosity about the process of refining silver. And as she watched the silversmith work, he held a piece of silver uh, over the fire. He held, you know, held a piece of, I don't really have anything silver colored, but he, uh, he held a piece of silver, you know, over the fire. And um, he let it heat up. And he explained uh, to the lady that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were the hottest as to burn away all the impurities. You're listening to this. And she asked the silversmith, if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the entire time the silver was being refined. And the man answered, yes, not only did he have to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eyes on it the entire time it was in the fire. He couldn't look around and watch something, you know, the game on TV. He had to, he had to be glued to it. If the silver was left even a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. <clears throat> the woman was silent for a moment <clears throat> and she asked then the silversmith how do you know when the silver is fully refined and he smiled at her and he said that's easy when I see my image in it how do you know when the silver is fully refined? And he said, when I see my image in it. You know, suffering is never pleasant. Sometimes it's from God, and sometimes it's from our bad decisions, or from the influence of those around us. But no matter where the suffering comes from, God is never far from us. He never allows us to remain in the fire longer than we can stand it. And when we have gone through the fire, when we have gone through the fire and the impurities have been burned away, then others around us can see the reflection of God in our lives. But first, First, we need to make a decision. You have to make a decision to be his child, to completely surrender to God and to trust him to get you through life's trials. We have to try hard to focus and to remember that while we are in the midst of a trial or swirling in sadness, or tangled in troubles, or dangling in difficulties, and seeing no way out. It's right then, it's right at that moment that God shows up. It's then that our hearts are truly open to his work in us. And even during the pains of life, he is right there with you, walking with you, holding your hand, carrying you. God is not taking you to the problem. He's taking you through the problem to refine you and to purify you 
and to mold you and to strengthen you. No, God had to have Moses wander the desert for 40 years and work as a shepherd in the wilderness, far away from that palatial and princely life he had once known, in order to have him ready to be usable by God. You and I are no different. We are being purified and refined, being built up for God's kingdom. You are being remade and given far greater strength through these trials of life. And in the name and the spirit of Yeshua the Messiah, Son of the living God, you are being made right now stronger ever after. Shabbat Shalom.